الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Welcome to the new uh, Friday حلقة And uh, again we are, we are dealing with Surah Nisa What we are talking about is or what we are trying to do is a thematic approach to understanding the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And again for those who are joining us maybe for the first time let me put things in perspective for you. We are actually approaching the surahs of the Quran from a thematic, meaning a semantic, mainly a semantic approach uh, with a focus on the meaning. And we are trying to see how every surah has a, a unified or one central theme and uh, how all the other subject matters of the surah connect to this central theme. So thus, every surah uh, presents one main idea. And... Uh, we have been going over Surah An-Nisa and what we figured out was that the central theme in Surah An-Nisa really appears clearly in the first verse of the Surah. And it's mainly about the unity of humanity and the different levels uh, or yeah, the different levels under which humans unite as well. So the most basic one is the family and then uh, we have the community and here we talk about the community of the believers, people who truly believe in Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu as the final messenger, and they follow this message. And then we have the whole family of humanity. And the surah addresses each one of those levels and addresses topics that are related to each one of those uh, levels. Uh, and what you will find, what puts all of this together is that Allah emphasizes throughout the surah, and specifically in the first verse, that he is the Lord, he's the Rabb, he is the creator, the sustainer, the one who takes care of his creation. And he is the one that we are supposed to uh, devote our lives to. We are supposed to worship, meaning he's the ultimate purpose of our lives. And what, thus what unites us and makes us one family as humanity is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the worship of our creator. So this is how these common themes or this is how these themes come together to create one thematic unity in Surat and nisa And this is, you will find throughout the Surah sometimes, a treatment of the uh, nuclear family level where Allah talks about laws of marriage, divorce, inheritance, uh, where Allah talks about familial disputes, disputes and how to deal with them. And probably today we're going to actually touch on some of those. And uh, then Allah talks about the Muslim family or the family of the believers, the community. And Allah addresses certain issues, what unites you know, this family and what keeps it together, what keeps the individuals bonded uh, within it. And uh, then Allah talks about threats uh, that could jeopardize uh, this family and uh, put it at risk, like talking about the hypocrites. And this is why actually a considerable part of Surah An-Nisa talks about the hypocrites because the hypocrites are a real challenge and threat to the family of the believers. And the hypocrites were not only limited to the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they actually exist in all times, but they come in different shapes and forms. And they come, we find, we have hypocrites at different levels. So this is why it's important because, and it shows since it's emphasized in the surah to such a great extent, it shows that the whole concept of hypocrisy is something that we have to keep an eye on and um, be very careful about in terms of of handling it because as, as we said it appears at different times in different shapes and the consequences of the presence of this segment of a community is extremely risky and, and dangerous and comes about with uh, a lot of serious consequences. And then Allah many times throughout the surah talks about the concept of Tawheed which is the oneness of God, the, 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 the sole right of Allah to be worshipped, that our devotion and our ultimate love should only be directed to our source of being, to our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have come to a point in the surah, and I believe where we stopped by verse number 113. Yes, so we can start with verse number 114. And again, let me just take an overview uh, over these five pages we're going to deal with. Uh, here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes certain principles and these are these are, there are actually here some of the central verses in the Quran some of the most frequently quoted verses in the Quran uh, and uh, what we find here that they contain principles on how to 
worship Allah, how to worship our Lord and how to remain true to our faith and to our original state, which again makes us all one family, that what we share as humans in reality is our natural tendency, our innate uh, need to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to know Him, recognize Him and then worship Him and live according to His guidance. Uh, so Allah talks about some of these things, then Allah puts, you know, the, the human family, the condition of the human family, humans all in general, in perspective and in relation to shaitan. So Allah tells us here about what shaitan really is trying to do and how we are supposed to protect ourselves from it, from shaitan. And then Allah uh, makes some reference to how he's going to hold people uh, to account. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns to the concept of some of the familial uh, regulations and rules with regards to, uh, for example, the rights of women, the issues of marriage, uh, and how to handle marital disputes. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala links this to the concept of taqwa, which is worshipping Allah, being mindful and being dutiful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of this, you know, the beautiful thing about Surah Al-Nisa, it connects all of these different levels and hierarchies so beautifully and organically that you can see that fiqh jurisprudence is strongly connected to our belief. And that what we do at a familial level, in, within our, the boundaries of our family and how we handle, for example, marital disputes, this actually should be a reflection of our relationship with Allah and how much we are mindful and dutiful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to talk about um, the concept of justice, fairness, standing with the truth all the time. Then Allah comes back to address the issue of the hypocrites. And Allah reveals a hidden aspect of their existence and their works here. And Allah warns us against them. Then Allah shows us what is the final end of those hypocrites because sometimes people can easily get frustrated with such a destructive segment of society or the community and think that these people get away with what they do. But Allah SWT shows us that the end of these people is going to be actually the, the worst. So this is what we are going to deal with. We might dwell on some of the verses um, in some detail and uh, this is due to the importance of these verses. So let's start with verse number one. Uh, for 114 Allah says Allah says Allah says, there is uh, not so much good in their private conversations, except for those who uh, recommend or advise people to do charity or to do something good or to bring about peace among people. And whoever does these things, any of these things, with good intention, seeking Allah's pleasure and contentment, then Allah shall reward these people with such a great reward. So, this is actually a very beautiful principle in our social activities and even our psychological health. You will find people having conversations many times. You will have, you see people uh, having private conversations, uh, people whispering to one another. And sometimes we are tempted humans to be part of, a, of conversations that we see. And that's why we humans, by the way, that's why we love to peek into other people's private life. That's why we love reading novels, stories. That's why we love watching uh, series, you know, TV series and reality TV. And um, we love to know, uh, you know, the private affairs of uh, celebrities and so on. And that's why we love vlogging as well. So because it's, it's part of humans, we are social beings and we would love to know about other people, we would love to get to know them more intimately and we would like to see more of their, of their secrets. So, and, and this comes with, a, with some negativity because if you cannot be part of a conversation, sometimes you feel bad about yourself. If you can't be part of a specific group or a specific clique, you might feel as an outsider, you feel you've been 
pushed aside or you've been ostracized or you're alienated. Uh, these, are, these become sometimes reasons for someone to feel as an outsider or rejected or unwanted or unwelcome. And it has serious consequences on their emotional health. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here puts human conversations that Allah says most of the conversations you see, most of what people talk about in the world here, most of that is actually has no goodness in it. Most of it is about matters that have no true value. But there is a small minority of these conversations where you will find people actually recommend and enjoy doing something that is good. For example, doing some charity, helping out people who are in need or uh, doing some, engaging in some noble cause, or doing something more ethical, or maybe bringing about reconciliation and peace uh, to, uh, to a relationship that is shattered by dispute and misunderstanding. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, These, this is a minority of conversations, and whoever engages in such conversations, they're actually, uh, with, with, with the intention that they should come from a place of seeking Allah's pleasure, doing these things not due to some personal benefit or some uh, maybe payoff they're trying to get. Although this might come as a byproduct, but people should engage in goodness as part of or as a reflection of a deeper appreciation of what life really means. As a believer, would that a believer is not just a word as it's not just lip service saying I believe in Allah on the last day. What a believer means is that this is how I see the world. That's what it means. It means I know that this world came about from Allah. Allah created it. Allah put it here and for a reason, for a specific purpose. And that Allah designed this whole universe for us, humanity, because Allah wants to put us through this test. And this test is about us choosing Allah or not. So this is a unique thing. With all of the creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made choices for them. But with humans, Allah left that choice unmade. Allah left it for us to, to, to make that choice. And He gave us that bubble of choice that was given to no other creature, no other, uh, other, other species in existence. Only humans have got this privilege that they can actually choose how they want to live or for what end they want to live, or what they want to do with themselves. They can either choose Allah, their creator, or they can choose something else. It's up to, it's up to them. And this is something so unique about humans. So uh, we should live our lives as if we claim we are believers, then this is our worldview. This is how we see who we are and who the world is and how we relate to the world. So Allah says, when you do these great things, you know, bringing peace into a relationship, uh, helping someone who's in need, or, uh, or, 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 or recommending some a good cause, an engagement in a good cause. So if that's what you do from this perspective, then you, you can expect great reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, but these good things could actually be done for other ends. And other ends could be simply as, uh, for example, maybe, again, getting some social reward or social currency or some recognition or maybe some kind of payoff or winning a favor over someone and so on and so forth. So Allah is saying the, the most of the conversations of humans are actually wasteful except for a, a small minority of them that are done for a good cause and this good cause is actually eventually fits within a greater frame. So you're doing a good thing and also for a good purpose, for a good end. That's how things should be. So this is a very beautiful principle that that can make us... Uh, I mean, it has an, in, an injunction, a subtle injunction here. And that is, you know, don't worry about being part of every conversation. What you should worry about is actually being part of constructive conversations that serve the right purpose. Uh, and if... You cannot be part of those, you can actually establish those. Because part of what makes people feel alienated when they cannot be part of a conversation is that they don't know what the conversation is about. They have no clue. And um, we have this, you know, curiosity. We, we want to we wanna see things. And this makes us reactive. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here gives us a, a, a better alternative and that's by initiating our own conversations and making them around something that is good and all of this should be within the frame of 
you know, the worldview that we embrace, which is that we are here to do something good with our lives uh, as part of our journey back to Allah. We come into verse number 115, and that's uh, a commonly quoted verse. Allah says, and whoever uh, disputes with the prophets, with the prophet, after the guidance has become clear, has, has been made clear to this person, and then this person chooses other than the path of the believers, we shall give this person what they have chosen, and we shall make them, um, we shall uh, make them live or abide in paradise or uh, in the hellfire, and what an evil abode. Um, this verse is quoted often to uh, substantiate the concept of ijma, which is consensus, specifically the consensus of the companions radiyallahu anhum, and it shows that following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, following the true guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, has different levels of conception. So the first level is following the Messenger وسلم. So Allah says, whoever disputes with the Messenger or rejects or opposes the Messenger, meaning this person rejected what the Messenger وسلم, came with. And what the Messenger وسلم, came with is the Qur'an, the spoken word of Allah, and the Hadith or the Sunnah which is basically the meanings that Allah inspired the Prophet ﷺ with and uh, the Prophet ﷺ spoke, him, spoke these words in his own words. So this is what we have from the Prophet ﷺ. So this is the, this is the foundational uh, element of Islam and following the Prophet ﷺ. But due to the gap in time, that we have between us and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sometimes you have a, a word from the Qur'an or a statement from the Qur'an or a statement from the uh, Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that has more than one interpretation. And sometimes it's difficult to choose which one it was actually intended in the religious text. So we have another level of uh, guidance or qualifiers, I would say, of indicators that can really help us point or figure out what is the intended meaning among the other possible ones. And this is the second one, which is uh, and this person follows other than the path of the believers. So uh, this verse is often quoted uh, to uh, prove the obligation of following the way of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Because no one truly, in this ummah, no one truly deserves the title or the description of believers more than the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And second in degree comes their students who are a tabi'een. Right? So here this verse is actually clear about following the Qur'an, the Book of Allah, and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, all of his authentic traditions, within the framework of the understanding of the companions and the tabi'een. By having all of these circles put together in alignment, it's actually, it's a greater guarantee that you are actually following the true guidance that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because even if, it, if at some level you have more than one option of understanding a specific text, then you have some extra uh, caution and you have some extra tools here to help you give preference to, to a, a meaning or one meaning or one interpretation over other interpretations. And that's the understanding of the companions, عنهم, they are the believers. So Allah recommends or Allah makes it an obligation to follow the path of the believers. And this is actually a very powerful verse against people who claim uh, to be following only the Qur'an. So they cast some doubt on the authenticity and the validity of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And thus they say, we only follow the Qur'an. They call themselves Qur'aniyin or Qur'anites or whatever. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an accurate name because if you want to be a Qur'ani, if you want to be someone who truly follows the Qur'an, then you have to follow the Prophet ﷺ and his Sunnah, and you have to follow the way of the, and this is what the Quran says, right? You follow the Prophet ﷺ and you follow the believers. So, 
So this verse is actually a very strong evidence against those uh, people who claim to take only the Qur'an and to discard the Sunnah uh, completely. And they have many arguments, but again, uh, upon uh, proper assessment, you see that it, they don't have any real proof to substantiate what they say. They're actually a departure from the, the, from the Ummah and from the history of the, of the, of the Ummah of Islam over 14 uh, centuries. But again, this verse is also used uh, to substantiate following the way of a salaf or the way of the righteous predecessors. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, whoever opposes the Messenger وسلم, after the guidance has been clarified to him and follows other than the path of the believers. Other than the path of the believers and the ones who deserve this title, the believers, are the companions. So anyone who follows the understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, other than that of the companions radiyallahu anhum, then these people have departed from the true path, either completely or partly, to, to a certain extent. And that's actually a very powerful, it's a very powerful, I would say, istidlal, as we say in the Arabic language. It's a very powerful meaning to take from the verse, and it's a very valid one. Uh, but again, here to highlight that not everyone who claims to be following you know, the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the way of, of the predecessors, uh, not everyone for uh, necessarily... Uh, lives up to that claim and unfortunately in these days it's become uh, it's, it's become a very chaotic uh, platform where many people who are immature who are not educated who, who have not who people who are impatient who have not really given themselves and other people the time for them to grow in knowledge and in maturity and in understanding and comprehension and, and building a, a, a good foundation of fiqh and the principles of fiqh and the principles of aqidah and a good understanding of history and human dynamics before these people put themselves in the forefront and start speaking and making you know, uh, claims and making uh, uh, big statements about who they are, what the truth is about a specific matter and who is deviant and who is not. And uh, these people have not done, a lot of these people, you can tell it's obvious, these people have not done inner work, which is actually part, a great part of the way of the companions, radiyallahu anhum, this kind of self-purification. For many of these people, I mean, self-purification has become a very technical thing, but it's, 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 a, it's a very deep and profound experience, uh, which is, because it, unless, as Imam Al-Qaim, rahimahullah ta'ala says, in most of his books, and specifically he, he emphasizes this a lot in his book, Madaraj al-Salikin. Uh, he says many times something to the effect that you cannot truly give Allah his rights or worship Allah properly unless you have a very comprehensive, deep understanding of the workings of yourself. He says because there is a lot of tricks, hidden subtle tricks that yourself plays on you. And, uh, and they are, they, they, they're not easy to detect and figure out. And uh, these, these, these games or tricks can completely hijack your path to Allah to the point that you might be thinking all of your life that you are uh, living in a state of devotion, sincerity, and that you are actually uh, dedicating your life for the sake of Allah and your effort and your time and doing so many things for the sake of Allah. But in reality, you're doing these things for some personal gain. He says you can actually live your life in this kind of doubt and delusion, or sorry, in this kind of, of a lie, that you, that you are living this kind of mirage without knowing. Why? Because you have not actually dug into yourself to figure out the workings of yourself, to know how the self has this dangerous proclivity of actually deceiving you and showing you things not as they really are. It's, it's a very... It's, it's, a, it's, it's not just a common thing, it's a ubiquitous thing. Everyone has this. And unless the person deliberately and consistently and over a long period of time, they, 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 they sort of unpack themselves and, and figure out these workings of the self that set them at this great disadvantage, the person most likely will not, will not make it to Allah SWT. Or if they make it, they will make it with so many injuries that would compromise on... Uh, almost everything that they have done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was a very important sort of uh, thing to clarify here because um, I'm personally aware that a lot of these 
uh, a lot of the misconduct of such people has pushed many people away from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, away from following the way of the Salaf and the and the, the and the companions and the early generations. Radiyallahu anhum. Um, why? Because of the misconduct, the bad manners, the the big egos of the people who I would say who are way too impatient that they put themselves in the forefront before realizing or understanding or grasping the real dynamics of how this life works and how the guidance and the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala applies to complex situations just like the times that we live in and most of those people and this is why I say they haven't given themselves enough a uh, chance to study the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you see they actually make big statements uh, that contradict things that are clear in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Understanding the Book of Allah is no easy topic. I mean, you could probably, if you work hard, you could probably memorize it in two years in average. Or maybe if you work um, like very, very hard, you might be able to memorize it in, in one year. But understanding it, you might even put so much hard work, and I'm telling you even 10 years is not enough to understand the basic meanings and the basic tafsir of the Quran itself. Let alone the Sunnah. We talk about the Sunnah. At least just focus on the core of the authentic Sunnah, Al Bukhari and Muslim. These take so many years just to understand the basic meaning, let alone understanding the fiqh of them. What about the sciences of fiqh and usul al fiqh that you will need to understand? What about aqidah that you will need to study in depth at many levels to really appreciate some many of the nuances? So if you put all of that together, and then not only that, but even have it have enough exposure to life and interactions with the world to, to realize that you can't take things at face value. Oftentimes things don't appear as they really are because we humans have the dilemma of perception and we have this kind of this principle of the least effort. Our minds work according to the principle of least effort which, is, which makes our minds very lazy. Our minds do not want to ex expend a lot of effort in figuring out things and understanding them so it would take everything, almost everything at face value and not bother really dig beneath the surface. So if you take, put all of these things together, it shows you that it takes quite a long time for someone to be able to put themselves on the forefront and be able to speak for the religion of Allah and for the truth and be able to classify people whether they are really following the religion right or they're doing it wrong. Now I'm not saying there's no room for advice and I'm not saying there is uh, no need for al amr bin ma'ruf and nahi al munkar but doing or applying these principles the wrong way just creates way 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 more damage than even the benefit that these people are expecting uh, from them and, and the solution is to um, i would say to allow uh, people who have done due diligence in studying islam and uh, relating to life and relating to the world um, to allow those people to be the, I would say, the, the ones who really create or bring about the decisions or perspective on how to handle our big affairs. And those the younger ones who are impatient can help them with whatever skills they have, but not for them to you know, take the, the position or they take the leadership and leave these scholars and students of knowledge, advanced students of knowledge, and wise people leave them behind just because you will find a lot of those uh, senior ones a lot of them don't have you know the technical knowledge of for example maybe knowing how to handle social media or knowing how to make videos or knowing how to keep up even with a lot of these social media platforms and they don't know about just being so outgoing online and exposing yourself to the world and talking about your private life and about some every issue that comes up where you have an opinion they're not that kind of person that's part actually that's part of their wisdom so we live in a hype culture and we, we sort of have this kind of preference for high people who are just talk about everything and they voice their opinion about everything and they jump you know to make a conclusion about everything even if it just popped up yesterday you really wonder that some of these issues require months and maybe years of careful consideration and study before a person makes an opinion yeah so so you will find a lot of those uh, youth they just bring themselves to the forefront and they talk quickly about anything it just pops up popped up yesterday you'll find they already formulated an opinion about it but 
you know, such an issue could take months, maybe sometimes, or maybe at least days of careful study and consideration before something is being uh, is being sent. And it's, it's very rare that you find someone who's profound and who's very well qualified and who has the qualities of leadership who are able to respond on this spot to such urgent issues. And we have to admit that it's not easy and it requires a, gr a great leadership to be able to do something like that. But leadership is not an inherent quality completely. It's not inherent, uh, although parts of it are inherent, but uh, leadership builds over time. It requires a lot of knowledge. It requires a lot of experience. It requires a lot of expertise. It requires a lot of maturity. It requires a lot of patience and a lot of personal development and wisdom and so on and so forth. So uh, again, the reason I'm saying this is the Sunnah and following the way of the companions has really got bad name in the last, I would say, uh, two or three uh, decades because of the practices, I would say erratic practices of many people who ascribe to uh, the right way to follow the Prophet ﷺ, which we find in this verse, verse number 115. Uh, then... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 116, and that's a very important verse. It's a very central verse in the Quran. Allah says, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna thalika li man yasha wa man yushrik billahi faqad dalla dalalan ba'idah. Allah says that Allah does not forgive. Allah does not forgive acts of polytheism. Allah does not forgive associating partners with Him. But He forgives other sins when He wills. And whoever associates partners with Allah, then this person has gone really far, far, far astray. And what that means, this is the central message of the Qur'an. Allah does not forgive shirk. And shirk is associating partners with Allah in worship or in His names and attributes. And um, it's human nature to recognize Allah, to seek Him and to worship Him, and to acknowledge His attributes, and His names, and His greatness, and His magnificence. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive shirk, because it's completely against human nature. It is a very violent departure from human nature. It's a great violation, and it doesn't come about naturally. Although I know these days, Often you hear or you will, you will see that people will try to show atheism or polytheism um, and any kind of, of, of uh, I would say, violation of, of the rights of Allah. People try to show that as a natural thing. It's just a choice. But again, this is a very surface approach because we humans are not computers. We're not just information processing uh, devices. We come into the world with some kind of an operational system. We already come into the world full of human nature. When, these, when this human nature is related to physical attributes, we call it instinct. When it comes to, to the way we think, we call that uh, principal cognitive functions or reflexes sometimes when they're physical as well. We also come with spiritual instincts, if you like, or reflexes. And these spiritual, uh, the spiritual content that we, we are, that's built in is the most profound because who we are in essence, in essence, we are souls, we are spiritual. So this is why the deepest and most powerful instincts, instincts we have is our spiritual nature. And in our spiritual nature, Worshipping others besides Allah is a great violation to this nature. You have to get out of your way to do something like that. You have to sort of destroy and abandon your nature in order to do something like that. It is like, it's, it's like, okay, let's, let's just take it to, to the level of, um, let's, make, let's make an, an analogy. For someone to completely oppose their instinct for food, for eating, that, like their need to eat. It's not natural. And if someone wants to do that, actually some people do that. Some people abstain from food, right? Some people 
abstain from food completely until they die and some people just go on a fast for long periods of time, 40 days, some, sometimes people 100 days. And some of them actually die in the process. But you know this is extremely difficult. You want to do this? It requires a lot of willpower, requires a lot of discipline, requires a lot of discomfort because you're going against your nature in that sense. Because your nature is that you're attracted to food, you feel hungry, you want to satisfy that need. The same thing, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, connecting to Him, obeying Him, being in touch with Him, uh, pleasing Him, knowing that you are in good relationship with Him is, is the same is even stronger than the need for food when it comes to our spiritual nature. So we have this need inside of us. And if we go against this, against it, it just requires so much hard work, just at least equivalent to the discipline that a person who abstains completely from food does in order to stay away from food. It requires a lot of discomfort, a lot of uh, discipline, a lot of hard work, a lot of suppressing your own nature and so on and so forth to actually depart from Tawheed. Tawheed is the natural way of humans. And probably, most likely actually, a lot of the anxiety and mental issues that people are having today, a lot of it comes from negligence of this. Because from a young age, people are actually are indoctrinated and are bombarded with messages that keep them busy with the world and take away any notion about Allah and about God and about the Creator and about the hereafter and about the next life and so on and so forth to the point that this spiritual nature is, is, is deprived and, 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 uh, and, and, and is, is undernourished to a point that it, it really goes, go, goes pale and goes sick and thus you can't have, you can't have a balance in life without, without that being satisfied. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive shirk. Now somebody might ask, what if someone was a mushrik or committed shirk, but then they repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, if their repentance is sincere, then Allah would forgive that. But, you know, all other sins, if a person comes back to Allah eventually, in, in, with a good heart and good intention, even though they might have missed to repent from their previous sins, Allah might actually forgive these sins. We call them in Arabic, تحت المشيئة. Under the will of Allah. Allah could actually wipe pe some people's sins on the Day of Judgment as long as they come with worship, with, with Tawheed to Allah. But if a person does not repent from shirk, there's no way there would be a repentance. There's no way that Allah is going to forgive that. And that's the gravest sin. So, uh, and Because this is the central thing. Worshipping Allah is the central thing. And among all things, that's the only thing you can't actually neglect in terms of fixing in, in, in your life. And if a person has shirk and they do not truly uh, give Allah his rights and then they do all other good things, all of these things are not going to have the weight that will benefit them on, in the hereafter. Because what gives all of these good deeds an extra dimension of, uh, of eternal impact is to hate itself. It's the secret that brings life to everything else in your life. So if it's missing, then all the good deeds might actually just... You, you will benefit from them because Allah is fair at the end of the day. Allah is going to give... People who have done good things, Allah is going to pay them back. And uh, most likely these people are actually getting paid back in this life. They are getting paid back in this life. It could be sometimes more provisions, more wealth, more money, maybe more fame, maybe more attention, maybe more facilitation in their affairs, uh, maybe some more fun... It, and, and, and other luxuries and so on and so forth. So they get paid eventually. Or maybe some harm that was coming this way, Allah protects them from it. Um, so Allah is not going to do injustice to any one of those people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here I'm going to go a little bit more quickly. Allah says, anything else they, 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 they worship other than Allah, these are just not things that truly deserve to be worshipped. Then Allah points out shaitan. Allah says shaitan is behind all of this. Satan. He's your enemy. And Allah says that shaitan made a vow that he's going to send humans astray. He's just acting out of jealousy. And you should keep that in mind. You should take him as your enemy and uh, never lower your, your guard. Just always be uh, you know, careful and be vigilant with regards to, uh, to shaitan. Allah says shaitan, what shaitan does is he beautifies. 
he promises, he gives false promises. And the people who, and this is what, you know, sometimes when someone wants to follow or commit a crime or do something bad, they always say, you know, I will get, if I do, if I do it, I will get this, I will get that. This is the false promise of shaitan. Or somebody says, you know, if I do that, if I follow my desires when it comes to these things, if I, you know, live according to this lifestyle, I'm going to be happy, I'll be successful, I'll be this, I'll be that. Many of these are just the false promises of shaitan, whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these people on the day of judgment, they will only find themselves in front of the hellfire and they are just going to end up there. Uh, then Allah compares them to the people who have truly believed they remain true to their own nature. So, so they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they do righteous deeds, they do goodness in this life, that Allah will enter them into uh, gardens under, 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 under which uh, rivers flow, that they will dwell there forever. And this is the true promise from Allah and who's more truthful in their word than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala generally speaking mentions, uh, for example, he says, uh, verse number 124, uh, And whoever does righteousness, does good things, uh, whether male or female, when they are in a state of belief and faith in Allah, and this, these people will be entered into Jannah and no justice will be ever done. And Allah says, who is better than someone who's better in their way of life than someone who has really turned their face to Allah, meaning they sought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have done good things and they followed the religion of Prophet Ibrahim, Abraham alayhi salam, which is the way of all the prophets and messengers, which is the worship of Allah alone. Then Allah uh, returns to speaking about issues that pertain to women in verse number 127. Uh, Allah talks about uh, the dowry of women, for example, of wives and how to give it to them. Then Allah talks about disputes here, number, verse number 128, 129. Allah talks about uh, when the husband and wife are in dispute, the relationship is not in good shape, that they can actually seek people to help them out, you know, sort out this kind of dispute or issues. And Allah says, always, you know, reconciliation has priority over everything. So there is, you will find in Islam, there's a lot of emphasis on keeping a marriage as, as, as much as possible, as long as it's within the boundaries of, um, of health, like emotional, psychological, and religious health. Um, so as long as there is room, it's better to keep the marriage. But if it uh, you know, if if making the marriage sur survive to the detriment of any of those who are involved, whether spiritually or psychologically or socially, then divorce can be considered. Um, yeah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about certain principles about what, it, what was always his message to all people. And that's basically to have taqwa of Allah, to worship Allah. When Allah speaks at that level, when, as, when he speaks about humanity in general, he's emphasizing the concept of the human family the, that can, includes all humans. And that really what the purpose of this, of the existence of this, uh, of humanity is in reality to connect to Allah, to worship him and make their way back to their creator. Then there's a beautiful principle that Allah emphasizes here and that's... Uh, did we cover that? No. Okay, yeah. So Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُنُوا قَوَّمِينَ بِالْقِسْطِ شُهَدَاءَ لِلَّهِ وَلَوْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَوِ الْوَالِدَيْنِ وَالْأَقْرَبِينَ إِيَّكُنْ غَنِيًّا أَوْ فَقِيرًا فَاللَّهُ أَوْلَى بِهِمَا فَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا الْهَوَىٰ أَن تَعْدِلُوا وَإِن تَلْبُوا أَوْ تُعْرِضُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرًا All you who believe, be so erect and so well established on justice. Always stand with justice and the truth in all situations. And be witnesses for Allah. Mean being witnesses for Allah on the truth. You always stand with the truth regardless of relationships, regardless of your own interest and so on and so forth. Allah says even if it's against yourself, even if, if the truth is going to work against yourself or against your parents or against those who are close to you. If this person is rich or poor, Allah is responsible for their uh, provisions. So meaning you do not resort to deception or lying or false testimony. 
in order to try to help someone, whether it's yourself or someone you care for or someone who's related to you. You can't help someone with falsehood. Falsehood is, oh sorry, truth is the highest value. And in Islam, you will find this clear. Truth is the highest value. And that's why one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Haqq. Allah is the truth himself. He's the ultimate truth himself. And this is why the truth is the ultimate value in Islam. Other values come under, under, under the value of the truth. And if anyone comes in opposition, if in any situation there is a value that competes with the truth, the ultimate truth, because even the truth could take certain levels, by the way. Any, anything, any other value that comes in conflict with the value of the truth, we give precedence to the truth. And, and, and in our fabric, humans, in our spiritual makeup, we are actually made of that element of truth. So we have this affinity to it. We have this connection to it. In a sense, it is who we are. So it's not like a fancy ideal, abstract ideal that we're just adopting and being inhumane when we sort of give it precedence. No, that's who we really are. We have this, this bond, this relationship, this natural intrinsic relationship with the truth because it's, it's part of our fabric. It's, this, it's, it's the central part of who we are, the truth. So in a sense, uh, Allah sort of, the, the truth in the creation, Allah split it into two. He put part, half of it inside of us and half of it in the external world. And this is why we humans are very, naturally are very interested in the world. We are very curious. We, we seek the truth. Why? Because ha the, half of the half of the truth that is within us is seeking its other half. It wants to complete the picture. And that's part of what makes us seek the truth in everything. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, generally speaking, gives advice to the believers about how to believe and emphasizes this. And then Allah addresses the issue of the hypocrites again. So basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to summarize what's about the hypocrites here. Allah says that they will receive severe punishment. And they actually, in their external behavior, you will find that they align themselves with the disbelievers over the believers. And that shows what's actually in their hearts. And they're always lying in wait, trying to take the Muslims by surprise, trying to bring about harm to the believers. So they don't, again, they have this enmity, this passive aggressive attitude towards believers. Um, and Allah says about them, ultimately Allah really clarifies what is the what the experience of hypocrites or the munafiqeen boils down to. Allah says in verse number 142, Indeed the hypocrites are trying to deceive Allah, but in reality the deception is coming back to them. So Allah is causing their deception to come back to them, to reflect back to them. And that's the ultimate loss, that you think you are outsmarting Allah, but you're actually just fooling yourself. That's the worst thing. And you don't, you don't realize it until the whole thing is over. And these people, when they approach the prayer, they approach it dragging themselves with so much laziness. They don't have energy for this Allah. Why? Again, because they don't have belief. And you know what energizes acts of faith is actually the faith itself, right? Because salah, fasting, any good deed is just an expression of faith. So when you lack the faith, why would you do something? You're doing it just to impress, right? Just for show. And that's not necessarily a great motivation. So this is why these people have to drag themselves to it. And Allah says that they keep changing their positions based on you know, what works in the best of their interest. Short-term interest, obviously. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately says in verse number 145, Indeed, the hypocrites are in the lowest recesses, the lowest levels of the hellfire, and they will have no helper, no ally. No one will come to help them. Why? Because they have just positioned themselves against the truth. And not only that, they've lied against about it. Allah says, except for those who repent and fix you know, the damage that they uh, have done. Um, that's it. And Allah concludes this and these sort of uh, you know, five pages we're dealing with, or four pages today. 
ما يفعل الله بعذابكم إن شكرتم وآمنتم وكان الله شاكرا عليما. You know, he, he says Allah سبحانه وتعالى here says, you know, what would Allah do with punishing with punishing you if you are thankful and if you are believers, if you stay true to your nature, if you humans just do what's right, why would Allah want to punish you? That shows that Allah doesn't gain anything from punishing anyone. The reason there is reward and punishment, there's paradise and the hellfire, is the truth, is the ultimate value of the truth. You, because if you remain true, you deserve that reward. If, if, if you violated the covenant of truth, that's not just a simple cognitive opinion. This is a violation of existence. This is a violation of your humanity. It's a violation of the divine principle according to which the whole universe was designed. It's, it's, it's extremely evil. And again, when we are acting from a world, or when we are thinking from a worldly perspective, we don't realize the gravity of this. For, for us, it's just another choice. But the reality is, no, you have to destroy so many things before you align with falsehood. You have to sort of break the structure of the world and violate it, the universe, creation, and violate it in, in a very despicable way for you actually to end up and to arrive at uh, falsehood and disbelief and also masking that disbelief. So Allah is saying, Allah doesn't want to punish you. Allah has no benefit in punishing anyone. But Allah has put a principle that if you act according to the truth, and if you do the right things, you're just going to get rewarded. But if you create damage, suffering, evil, violation, you bring so much evil into the world, then you just have to face the consequences. And here are the consequences, and they are severe. They held fire, and Allah described it in detail in the Quran. So it's your choices. It's your choices. Again, Allah does not gain anything from punishing anyone. But Allah abides, Allah created the principle of the truth in the creation and Allah made it binding upon Himself to, uh, to deal with people based upon that. So it's commitment from Allah. It's, it's a gift from Allah. It's truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if anyone thinks, you know, you know why just not punish anyone, etc., it would be much better, much rosy. This, this basically shows immaturity and uh, lack of you know critical thinking because it is similar to saying in school you know everyone passes whether they attended lectures and classes or not whether they sat for exams or not just you know give them um, give them a pass and give them a certificate right and it's just like uh, you you are in a company or an organization and employees who do good job and contribute to the success of the organization and those who you know are absent who don't sign in who don't do the work waste their time and maybe playing games on social media etc and they don't have any level of productivity they don't contribute to the success of the organization treat them the same right why lay off people who are not contributing that's cruel right again this is this kind of fancy uh, you know Thinking, it's it's what they call, they call this. I think cry bullies, right? Uh, these extremely very very sensitive. Although they're not sensitive, they're just sensitive to only a small spectrum of things that they have selectively chosen with so much bias. But they have complete indifference to important moral principles that are greatly consequential. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, that's what success is, and that's what you know loss is. Success is in line with your design, your original original design, your fitrah, and I've given you all the tools, everything in the world actually helps you take this path. But if you want to take this path at your own peril, it's very difficult. There will be temptations, but it's extremely difficult because you have to depart from your own human nature. You have to break so many principles. You have to violate a lot of moral barriers that are instilled inside of you in order to make it there. But at the end of the day, if you that's the choice you want to take, you want to make, Allah created humans, the whole test of humanity is the concept of choice. So, again, so all of this, again, uh, treats uh, the whole concept, again, of family at the level of the nuclear family, community, and humanity. 
and linking all of this to the concept of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah here is talking about the function and the purpose of the family at all of these levels and Allah gives some instructions on how to handle these and the most important one is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because our existence is about worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is it for uh, this week inshallah hope to see you uh, next Friday with the last part of Surah An-Nisa. Jazakumullahu khairan wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.